Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 412. I'm the host, Kyle Anzalone. Got a lot of news on today's show. I've been writing a bunch of articles for either Antiwar.com or the Libertarian Institute. So I'm going to break those down and some other news that is really important. Be sure to share today's show. This is, I, I think, going to be a really good one. Uh, you can find it at the Libertarian Institute on the blog at Antiwar.com. YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey for the video version of the show. And then you can follow me on Twitter at Kyle Lanslone underscore. Let's get into the news. All right, the first article I have here is really, really important. It's by Connor Freeman, uh, the co-host of the show. Ed CIA chief led campaign to smear Hunter Biden laptop story as Russian disinformation. Mike Morrell, the former acting CIA director, revealed to the House Judiciary Committee, led by Representative Jim Jordan, that he played a key role in rallying former intelligence officials to sign a letter which sought to discredit reporting on the Hunter Biden laptop scandal during the 2020 presidential campaign. In a transcribed interview with Jordan's team, Morell explained that his role in the suppression of the key story was done on behalf of the Joe Biden campaign and at the behest of now Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was then a senior campaign official. According to the committee's press release, Morell testified that on or around April 17th, 2020, Blinken reached out to him to discuss the Hunter Biden laptop story. According to Burrell, although Blinken's outreach was couched as simply gathering Morell's reaction to the post story, it set in motion the events that led to the issuance of the public statement. The committee is now investigating the Hunter Biden laptop as well as the Biden family's international business dealings. And I just want to make it clear here that this isn't, you know, China gate for Biden as far as the business dealings go. I think that there are some in the Republican, you know, sphere that like to put out this idea that Biden is somehow owned by the Communist Party of China. If you look at his policies, this is clearly not the case. Um, You know, I'm not saying the guy doesn't have corruption in in his background and, you know, some of that corruption may even be with some people in China. Uh, But if you look, you know, there's people like Steve Bannon who who have done corrupt deals with with people in China. And so it's far more complicated than to just assert that Biden is owned by Beijing. And, you know, if if there is any influence peddling in China, my guess is that uh, it tends to be towards the, the more hawkish elements, uh, you, you know, against the CCP, you know, people who don't want to see China, th- you know, under its current regime uh, thrive because Biden has been very, very aggressive on the China issue since becoming president. All right. Connor gives us some uh, little important background here. The story about Hunter Biden's laptop was originally published in October 2020 by the New York Post. The laptop was abandoned at a Delaware computer repair shop in 2019. The Post published subpoenas which showed the FBI had seized the laptop. However, the shop's owner had made a copy of that laptop's hard drive and provided it to the Donald Trump ally and former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. In September 2020, the Post was tipped off about the laptop's existence by Steve Bannon. Twitter, Facebook, and other major platforms outright censored or took actions to suppress the reach of the story immediately. The letter that was organized by Morrell, which was signed by more than 50 former intelligence officials seeking to discredit the report, was published by Politico on October 19th, five days after the story was originally reported by the Post. Echoing statements made by the Biden campaign, the letter claimed the Post reporting has all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation has since been confirmed by several media outlets, including Politico that the laptop belonged to Hunter Biden and its contents are authentic. The House Committee's press release continues. Morrell also explained that the Biden campaign helped to strategize about the public release of the statement. Morrell further explained that one of his two goals in releasing the statement was to help then Vice, Pre- uh, then Vice President Biden in a debate and to assist him winning the election. During... The Barack Obama administration in the wake of the 2014 U.S. back coup in Kiev, then President Vice, uh, then Vice President Biden's son Hunter landed a highly lucrative job on the board of Burisma, a Ukrainian national gas company. The story revealed, among other things, that in 2015, Hunter Biden introduced his father to a top executive at Burisma, who had previously sought Hunter's influence to help the company. 
Joe Biden has previously said that he held up a major U.S. loan, I think it was through the IMF, to Kiev in order to pressure Ukrainian officials to fire a prosecutor who was at the time investigating Burisma corruption. Morell said he conducted a little bit of his own research before soliciting Mark Polymopoulos, a retired senior CIA operations officer, for his aid in compiling the letter, which was also signed by the lights of former CIA chiefs John Brennan and Leon P- uh, Panetta. So I think this story is already really bad. You have here the Biden campaign using the you know former intelligence community to construct this letter uh, to basically combat information that was true, right? They put out disinformation, and uh, the Biden campaign certainly... Uh, had to be aware that that laptop was authentic because, you know, they have access to Hunter, who, you know, should at least be able to confirm if the emails are authentic or not, even if he was, you know, too high, say, to remember they dropped off the laptop at this particular shop. Uh, certainly, you would assume somebody on the Biden team would be able to authenticate uh, pictures of his son and emails that his son sent. And so, you, you, they put out disinformation to help him win the election. They took a story that they knew was true, and then they provided false information on top of that to uh, at least make it gray as to whether that was true or not. However, it gets far worse here. Joe Biden himself exploited the letter during the October twenty twenty uh, October twenty two presidential debate with Trump. Uh, accusing Moscow of targeting his son in an elaborate propaganda operation for his part in this scheme to cover up the critical story, which may have mortally threatened Biden's chances of winning the election. Morell was thanked personally by Steve Raichi, the chair of the Biden campaign, in a phone call after the debate. Morell was reportedly being considered as a candidate to lead the CIA under the Biden administration position now held by William Burns, though he claims he was never really former formally in talks about the job. On Thursday, Jordan and Representative Michael Turner, the chair of the Select Committee on Intelligence, sent a letter to Blinken requesting his communications relate to the investigation, including those with Morrell. So you see, even what the President of the United States did, he took a story that he knew was real, claimed it was Russian propaganda, and, and it planted that story in the media and then brought it up at the debate citing that letter to to say like look how you know this is obviously false even our former intelligence community says so but his campaign was the one that had the intelligence community come up with the letter even though they knew the the documents and the the emails were all authentic and, and so this is you know pure disinformation and it comes very close to you know kind of what we see in the lead up to the Iraq war with Judith Miller and Dick Cheney where Cheney was providing information to Judith Miller who would publish it uh, in the mainstream media, and then Dick Cheney would get up and say, well, look, they, you know, they're saying it in the Washington Post that this is what's going on, so clearly this is what's happening, and uh, you know that this is exactly what you have Biden doing. The House Committee's press release concludes Morrell and his senior former intelligence chiefs participated in a concerted ad to minimize and suppress vital information to project the Joe Biden campaign, arguing that the deception prevented American citizens from making a formally informed decision in the 2020 presidential election. And, you know, it's really hard to argue this. And and it really uh, makes me think back to that time story that myself and Joanne Leone covered on the the show. I believe it was in January 21 after it was released, talking about how an elite cabal won the election for Joe Biden. Well, I mean, what what's more of an elite cabal than former CIA directors putting out a, a fake letter to, you know, misinform the American people about what's happening here? Morrell was the acting CIA director for the CIA for two months during 2011 and again for four months between 2012 and 2013. He was a big booster of the Hillary Clinton campaign for president in 2016 and remains an avid defender of the post 9-11 torture regime. In 2016, the on the Charlie Rose show, he also publicly called for the U.S. to support armed groups with directions to kill Russians and Iranian forces in Syria. 
Morale clarified that Tehran and Moscow should pay a price for supporting Damascus and that this should be done covertly so you don't tell the world about it. <laughs> and, of course, he's saying this on the Charlie Rose show publicly. You don't stand up at the Pentagon and say, we did this, but you made sure they know it in Moscow and Tehran. So, you know, this guy is an absolute lunatic, a part of the deep state. And, you, you know, more so than Vladimir Putin, certainly, or anyone else, is somebody who manipulated a U.S. election. All right, this is a huge story and a real threat to, you know, all of our First Amendment rights. Biden Department of Justice did, indicts four Americans for their political views on Russia. The Justice Department has indicted four Americans, including three members of the Af African People's Socialist Party and the Uthuru Movement, ASAP. SP. The, the initials are APSP over their political views on Russia, a step that has grave implications for First Amendment rights. The allegation against the Americans is that they were involved in a foreign malign influence campaign directed by the Russian FSB. The Department of Justice has also indicated three Ru also indicted three Russians related to the case, including Alexander Anovo, who is indicted who was initially indicted last year anova is a moscow resident who founded the anti-globalization movement of russia agmr a non-governmental organization the deal claims that he used agmr to conduct russia's malign influence campaign and recruit americans to spread russian propaganda the indictment alleges that russians were involved in a 2019 local election in St. Petersburg, Florida, one where the APSP is based. Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service allegedly weaponized First Amendment rights, freedom. Russia denies its own citizens to divide Americans and to interfere in our elections in the United States, said Assistant Attorney General Matthew G. Olson. And I really hate that phrase, weaponize the First Amendment. It's just, you know, they say that in order to be able to trample on the First Amendment, offices and homes affiliated with APSP were raided by the FBI in 22 over the group's connections to the AGMR. The leader of APSP, who was indicted by the DOJ, pointed out that after the raid, that his group had worked with the organization around the world with organizations around the world for decades. At our first party Congress held in Oakland, California in 1981, we received solidarity statements from organizations and governments from around the world. Uh, he wrote in an article published by antiwar.com in March of 2023. So that was last month. This helps to give lie to notion that our connection to a Russian government NGO is evidence of illicit relationship that we have with a foreign power, he said. He strongly denied that his group was working for Russia and they appear to have been targeted for their political beliefs. The APSP has expressed support for Russia and denounced U.S. involvement in Ukraine, but the group has been speaking out against U.S. foreign policy since it was formed in 1972. He said that the art in the article that he had expected to be indicted and the group would likely use the FARA Foreign Agents Registration Act to go after him and his group. And of course, you know, uh, most people in Washington, D.C., they could go after under FARA, uh, but, the, you know, they just choose not to because most of the time they like foreign money flowing into the United States. I don't know if these APSB people are, you know, actually violated that act in some way, even if it you know, isn't something they should go to jail for if it's something nobody goes to jail for. Um, but, you know, their guilt is still alleged. And, you know, maybe under the statute, they could find a way to, you know, criminalize what they were doing. Uh, but at the same time, this is pretty clearly a political prosecution. All right, this next article that I wrote for the Libertarian Institute yesterday, April 23rd, Ukraine asked NATO for boosted military support to deliver victory. Kiev's war goals have changed from survival to victory, according to Ukraine's uh, top defense of official. Ukraine's more ambitious goals come as, as Western backers have continued to buy more advanced weapons and training for Ukrainian soldiers. The remarks from Ukrainian officials were made at a meeting of NATO defense ministers in Germany. 
Speaking with NBC News at the summit, Ukrainian defense minister said, there is a very pos- probable a uh, palpable conviction among our partners that Ukraine should win. That will be a joint success. Um, so the remarks uh, Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky said Kiev's goals. Uh, oh, I'm sorry here. I uh, I missed his. Oh, no. All right. Never mind. I'm in the right place now. So <laughs> Ukrainian President Zelensky said Kiev's goals is to reclaim all Ukrainian territory, including the Donbass and Crimea. The Crimean Peninsula was annexed by Moscow after a 2014 U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine, and the people of the region voted overwhelmingly to join the Russian Federation. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has admitted Crimea was a red line for the Kremlin and risks a major response. Three Ukrainian officials said they were optimistic because past gatherings of the Ukrainian Defense Contact Group, UDCG, at the Ramstein Air Base in Germany have resulted in major arms transfers to U- Ukraine. During this meeting of the UDCG, Kiev is pushing for more fighter jets and assistance combating the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. The White House has resisted pressure to send warplanes to Kiev for about a year. However, the U.S. and U.K. have begun training Ukrainian pilots on Western-made fighter jets. Additionally, some Eastern European countries have transferred Soviet-era MiG-29s to Ukraine. A Ukrainian defense official believes the war with Moscow is long and Kiev will need F-16s to win. This war is far from over. Russia is not going to disappear. Russia is not showing any signs they want to stop this war either. He said, for us to be more efficient and successful on the battlefield, they will need to give us fighter jets and we will need F-16s because they will give us superiority in the air in the long term. Ukrainian foreign minister asked the European Union last week, uh, attacked the European Union last week for failing to deliver artillery munitions to Ukraine in a timely manner. The inability of the EU to implement its own decision on the joint procurement of ammunition for Ukraine is frustrating, he tweeted. Michael Kaufman, the director of the Russia Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis, made a recent trip to Ukraine and expressed that Western nations were delivering weapons, but Kiev was struggling with logistics of moving them to the front lines. The main thing you hear on the front lines is the Ukrainian military has internally distribution problems, so a lot of their gripes have to do with their own logistics. He continued, things enter Ukraine, but then Ukrainian units have to find their way of getting those things, and there are a lot of challenges in that. And he did say this is something that is common in war zones, uh, but you, you had to imagine, you know, especially with the reporting to Seymour Hersh, that some of this stuff may be uh, siphoned off, smuggled, sold, and, and things like that. On Friday at the summit, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, announced the U.S. was moving 31 Abrams tanks to Germany, where Ukrainian soldiers would learn the weapon system. After a 10-week training period, the tanks and the troops will head to the battlefield. Milley said the tanks were not a silver bullet, but he believes when it is delivered and reaches its operational capacity, it will be very effective on the battlefield. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin also attended the 11th UDCG meeting. He said, countries are not thinking about how they can increase industrial production, are thinking about how they can increase industrial production, not just for the near term, but also for the medium and the long term, he said. And that is a powerful reminder that we stand with Ukraine's defenders for the long haul. Since the Russia invasion, the White House has worked with the military industrial complex to increase production of weapons. Defense Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hitz recently told reporters that the U.S. is buying all the arms it possibly can for Kiev. Make no mistake, she said. We are buying to the limits of the industrial base, even as we are expanding those limits. We're continuing to cut through red tape and accelerate timelines. While Kiev seems primarily focused on naval support and warplanes, its Western partners are concerned about the country's air defenses. Documents allegedly released by Dad Tashera show Ukraine is projected to run out of interceptors during the coming weeks. Austin remarked, Ukraine's urgently needs are help to shield its citizens and infrastructure 
from Russian missile threats. Last week, the Ukrainian defense minister confirmed that the U.S. and Germany had each transferred a Patriot missile defense system to Ukraine. He enthused that receiving the Patriot systems was like a dream and was previously told that Kiev would never receive the interceptors. The U.K. Defense Minister Ben Wallace pledged London will accelerate its armed shipments to Ukraine, including air defense missiles. The acceleration of military support was done with the focus of the meeting with ministers progressing deliveries to bolster Ukraine's capabilities as they plan to expel Russian forces from illegally occupied territory, a statement from the U.K. government said. And just, you know, a, a final wrap up on this, this uh, Ukraine defense contact group, I think they meet about every month now and Austin indicate that that might happen virtually. But as long as this group is meeting, I would expect that about every month you're going to see a major transfer of weapons and new support for Ukraine coming out of these meetings because they got to generate some kind of headlines. All right, next up, I wrote this for antiwar.com on Friday. U.S. sending Abrams tanks to Germany to train Ukrainian soldiers. And I mentioned this a little bit in the last article, but let's get into a little bit more detail here because there are some other important notes. America's top military officer said the Pentagon will ship 31 Abrams tanks to Europe next month. Once in Germany, Ukrainian soldiers will train on the weapons platform until the tanks and troops are deployed to the battlefield. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, made the announcement while meeting with NATO partners in Germany. Milley said the tanks were not a silver bullet, but he believes when they are delivered and reach the battlefield operational capability, it will be very effective on the battlefield. Uh, the White House authorized sending Abrams tanks to Ukraine in January. Initially, the U.S. planned to purchase new tanks for Kiev. However, last month, the Pentagon announced they had accelerated the timetable for providing the main battle tanks in order to accommodate the short timeline. The Department of Defense planned to refurbish and transfer tanks already in the American stockpile. For nearly a year after the Russian invasion, the Joe Biden administration refused Kiev's request for the provision of Western-made tanks. The White House authorized the transfer of Abrams tanks to increase pressure on Berlin to allow German-made Leopard 2 tanks to be transferred to Ukraine. The scheme worked and resulted in Berlin sending 14 of its Leopard 2 tanks to Kiev. Additionally, the German government has allowed several other European states to send their Leopards to Ukraine. I think I saw a stat now. There's about 230 Western-made tanks that have been pledged uh, to go to Ukraine so far. I'm not sure how many of those have reached the battlefield, actually. On Friday, NATO defense ministers announced the alliance would create a hub to repair Leopard tanks in Poland near the border with Ukraine. Member states pledged about $220 million in funding for the facility this year. Milly said that two to 300 Ukrainian troops will travel to Germany to train on the Abrams tanks in a 10-week course. Milley added the U.S. had already trained about 9,000 Ukrainian soldiers and was in the process of getting 2,500 2, more troops per fair per battle. And those are total that not just for tanks, that includes everything like the Patriot systems uh, that we're going to talk about next. All right, so I already covered a lot of what was in this article uh, during the the other article when we were talking about air defenses. Uh, but I just wanted to mention here that that according to the uh, German outlet, Ukraine will only receive one uh, system from each the U.S. and Germany, while the Netherlands are sending spare missiles and parts. I think each Patriot system has three launchers with three radars because there's a 120 degree field of view for each radar, and it takes about 90 people to operate. Now, some of my questions here come from uh, the fact that the last month the Pentagon claimed 65 Ukrainian soldiers had trained in the U.S. to become proficient on the platform ahead of schedule. And then German defense officials said that uh, Germany was training the Ukrainian soldiers during NATO war games in an unspecified country. And so maybe Germany trained extra Ukrainians here, and, and that accounts for the difference, but it doesn't seem like the U.S. actually trained enough uh, Ukrainians to operate one of these systems. And so, uh, you know, the 
the the systems the Patriots in particular may not be as useful as he claims they can't shoot down hypersonics, which Russia has been using. There, you know, it could be used for warplanes, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles. However, they're about four million dollars for each Patriot interceptor, uh, so they're really expensive. While Russia has been using a lot of uh, cheap explosive drones to carry out its attacks, and so if you're using a four million dollar missile to shoot down a hundred thousand dollar drone uh you you know even if you successfully carry out the intercept in the long run your side's kind of losing uh all right so let's uh move on here ukraine foreign minister slams eu for not delivering ammunition as planned and I, i again this is something that i mentioned in one of my other articles already uh but I think this is important to talk about in a little bit of detail because, in a way, I understand the Ukrainians' pain here. Not that I want this war to go on, not that I want the West to be delivering millions of rounds of ammunition to Ukraine. However, they are being used as cannon fodder for the West proxy war against Ukraine. And, you know, the fact that they're appealing to get more military equipment to, to carry out, you know, more. Uh, you know, to make their soldiers, you know, have the the best chance they can, that that is understandable to me. At the same time, of course, the, the U.S. has provided billions of dollars. Its allies have provided, you know, hundred billion dollars or so uh, of aid to Ukraine at this point, and it does seem pretty ungrateful uh, from the Ukrainian side that they are you know, saying, oh, this isn't reaching fast enough and everything. It really, you know, the Ukrainian government needs to realize the situation and negotiate an end to this conflict rather than lying on an endless stream of aid. This is something that has happened in the past. And we have uh, seen the White House, you know, kind of complain to Ukraine that the uh, the the complaining about not getting enough aid doesn't play well in the, the, the United States when we've already sent so much. All right, so this is important. In Kiev, NATO chief says Ukraine's rightful place is in the alliance. And this is by Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. On Thursday, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg made his first visit to Ukraine since Russia launched its invasion last year and declared that Kiev's rightful place is as a member of the Western Military Alliance. Ukraine's rightful place is in the Euro-Atlantic family. Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO. And over time, our support will help to make this possible, Stoltenberg said at a press conference with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. Ukraine was first promised NATO membership in 2008, despite warnings from then-U.S. Ambassador to Russia, William Burns, who now serves as CIA Director, that Moscow views Ukrainian NATO membership as the brightest of all red lines. NATO significantly stepped up its support for Ukraine following a 2014 U.S. bat coup in Kiev that ousted Viktor Yanukovych. Over the years, NATO allies have been providing training for tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers, Stoltenberg said in Kiev. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Stoltenberg has repeatedly pledged Ukraine would eventually become a member, but Kiev has never been given a timeline. Some NATO members want to give clear statements to Ukraine on potential membership at a summit that will be held in the Lithuanian capital this July, but the U.S. is reportedly pushing back against the plan. And it's pretty clear that the NATO wants to use Ukraine to provoke Russia, the the potential for adding Ukraine to the alliance, but at the same time doesn't want to go far enough uh, to actually add Ukraine to the alliance because, of course, this will uh, break Russian red lines. And so, you know, they want to be able to fight the proxy war in Ukraine to weaken Russia. Adding Ukraine to NATO makes that impossible. Uh, saying Ukraine won't join NATO lessens Russia's concern and need to fight the proxy war in Ukraine. And so they're going to stay the ambiguous course to make sure that Russia feels like Ukraine might join and uh, you, you know, that, that provo- provocation is on the table without pushing it too far. All right, next up, I wrote this one for antiwar.com on Friday. Lead documents, Ukraine planned attacks on Russian forces in Syria. So this, this, this is wild. All right. Kiev's military intelligence agency believed it could carry out attacks on Russian soldiers and Wagner group forces in Syria forcing Moscow to redeploy military assets from Ukraine. The story was reported by the Washington Report, 
uh, post using documents allegedly leaked by Jad Teixeira. The Ukrainian defense officials believe they could use Kurdish forces to wage a proxy war against Russian forces in Syria. According to the Post, the plan never materialized as President Zelensky ordered an end to the planning in December. It appears that Ukrainian officials engaged in some discussions with the Syrian Democratic Forces, a Kurdish militia backed by the U.S. The documents say the Kurdish officials requested training on drones and air defenses. Additionally, the Kurds said they would not attack Russian positions near areas held by the SDF and requested their role in the operations be kept secret. Ukrainian Ukraine declined to respond to questions about the document. A Kurdish official claimed the information was false. Russian forces have been in Syria since 2015. President Vladimir Putin ordered his soldiers to aid the Syrian government led by Bashar al-Assad. At the time of the Russian intervention, both al-Qaeda in Syria and ISIS were threatening to topple Damascus. The Russian soldiers helped the Syrian forces turn back the advance of the jihadist groups. While Moscow continues military operations in Syria, the Kremlin is attempting to end the conflict through diplomatic means. Putin is attempting to broker a deal to normalize relations between Syria and Saudi Arabia. Riyadh is the primary backer of the anti-Assad militants in Syria and has received pressure from Washington to continue to isolate Damascus. The document says Zelensky could allow the operations to proceed but would likely require assistance from the U.S. and Turkey. Ankara may be unwilling to support the covert proxy warfare as it views the SDF as a turtle. Uh, as a terrorist organization and has long protested Washington arming the Kurdish forces. Additionally, the operations could inflame the war in Syria. The decades long war has seen a dip in violence in recent years as Assad and his allies have consolidated control over most of Syria. The U S and the SDF, SDF occupied the eastern third of the country. However, the SDF leadership has shown a willingness to work with Moscow if Kurdish forces allow themselves to become a proxy force for Kiev, Moscow will likely aggressively target SDF positions in eastern Syria. So that, that, that story is very concerning. Now, luckily, Zelensky, you know, that this shows a little bit of sanity from him that he, he put a stop to this plan. Uh, who knows why? Did Turkey protest? Did the Americans protest? Uh, you know, I, I would like to hear more about that, but... Uh, the fact that Zelensky stopped it is some good news, and uh, let's hope that this one doesn't get revived. Now, GOP lawmakers tell Biden they won't support unrestrained aid for Ukraine. Now, this is a limited number of Republicans, uh, three senators and 16 members of the House. So this isn't enough to really do anything, right? You, you, I guess the three senators, as any individual senator, has quite a bit of power you know, they, 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 they can make a stink about things, but it's certainly not enough to really alter the legislation or to, to change what's going to happen. You know, Rand Paul votes against all kinds of stuff as the lone Republican are with maybe only Mike Lee or, you know, maybe Mike Lee and Bernie Sanders are thrown in there. But ultimately, you know, they, they don't make much uh, noise that way. Now, Thomas Massey didn't sign on to this letter, and I do wonder if it's because it takes the tone of a lot of the Republican opposition for arming Ukraine, which is, what about Taiwan? We got to worry about that war with China coming up, which is hardly better. Now, my Rand Paul really doesn't take that line as a Republican. I'm not saying that he is you know, friendly with the CCP or anything like that, but if we look at like the tit top ban and things like that, he's one of the few Republicans that isn't overly emotional and afraid of Beijing. And so he's able to put together coherent statements and views on what's happening with China. So I, I don't have a problem with him signing on to this letter because the main message is about the unrestrained Ukraine aid. But I do understand if some people want to hold off because they were concerned about how it says, oh, well, you know, the real concern here is China. Um, you, you know, that's not good. All right. U.S. announces new $325 million arms package for Ukraine. Uh, this includes additional ammunition for the HIMARS, 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter artillery rounds, two launched optically tracked wire guided tow missiles, AT-4 anti-armor weapon systems, anti-taint mines, 
demolition munitions for obstacle clearing, over 9 million rounds of small ammunition, four logistic support vehicles, precision aerial munitions, testing and diagnostic equipment to support vehicle maintenance and repair, port and harbor security equipment, spare parts, and other field equipment. The Pentagon also released a fact sheet on Wednesday that details the enormous amount of military aid the U.S. provided Ukraine. It says the Joe Biden administration has committed more than $36.1 billion in military aid for Kiev, including $35.4 billion that has been pledged since the Russian invasion on February 24, 22. I think that number is actually uh, probably getting close to $50 billion, if not more. I should check the, uh, the Kiel Institute to see if they have any new updates. This is from Dave DeCamp, uh, very important. Afghan Washtenaw says you're going to see proliferage of U- Ukraine aid. So he's just warning that, you know, this aid is going to, uh, you know, be spilled out all over the place, uh, as happened in Afghanistan. He said the money is flowing like manna from the sky. Uh, so, so this is exactly what you had spent. Uh, Sopko said he would, John Sopko is the special investigator general for Afghan reconstruction. He said he was not just concerned about military, uh, assistance to Ukraine, but also a disbursement by the U S agency for international development, USAID. We've always had more problems with aid in Afghanistan. My experience is that they, have not been a very well-run organization, he said. And, of course, right now, USAID is led by Samantha Power, who is a regime change hawk and somebody who thinks that, uh, you you know, they can organize the rest of the world the way they want. You know, she's a main backer of the war in Libya and things like that. Uh, Stop could point to the fact that USAID was overseeing aid payments uh, that pay the salaries of Ukrainian government workers in Afghanistan. Sopko said the Pentagon directed the paying of government salaries and could never come up with a system to make sure the U.S. was paying the salaries of real Afghans. Well, you have heard anybody saying that's what the system they have in place to ensure that they're not paying ghost Ukrainian civil servants goes to Ukrainian police and goes to Ukrainian soldiers. He said, Sapko said USAID has a poor track record on ghosts and oversight. So the ghost soldiers, the, the ghost employees are basically, let's say you're, you know, uh, the commander of a brigade in Ukraine or something like that. If you say you have a hundred more soldiers than you have and make up documents uh, about these soldiers, well, then you could get monthly payments for those 100 soldiers and that's an awful lot of money that that you could rake in doing things like that and so you know maybe a smaller scale somebody's got supposed to have 10 people working for them they only have five and they're collecting five ghost salaries but still uh, this is a major problem and congress has just outright refused uh to send uh or to approve authorize any kind of oversight for the aid in ukraine All right, next up here, U.S. allies consider a ban on all export to Russia. This is huge. Uh, So this is going, the the discussions are happening now. There's a G7 meeting in May where, you know, we should hear the decision. And basically what this is going to do is overhaul the way Washington outlaws its trade with Russia. Currently, the U.S. and its allies blacklist particular Russian products, companies, and individuals, barring Americans from business transactions with the targeted entities or in the targeted products. However, if adopted, the export ban will prohibit all trade with Moscow that is not explicitly exempted from Western sanctions. So it, it flips it, right, right? So right now, you want to do business with Russia. You look at the U.S. list and you say, okay, I can't do business with any of these people on the list. I can't do business with any of these companies on the list. I can't trade in any of these products on the list. But if it's not on the list, it's fair game. Now they're saying that basically they're going to just exempt food and medicine and ban all other trade. Now, you would assume there's not very much trade going on with Russia, but actually that number might be a little bit higher. While Russia... 
while Western trade with Russia has taken a major hit since the invasion of Ukraine last year, several G7 members have maintained significant exports despite Washington's attempt to isolate Moscow with sanctions. According to the Trade Data Monitor, a cumulative $66 billion in goods have flowed to Russia from member states over the last year. And so this is the U.S., Canada, Italy, France, U.K., Japan, and then uh, the European Union. So that's so that's a lot of countries, but that's still a lot of trade uh, since, you know, the, these countries have primi- primarily been the one uh, backing Ukraine's proxy war against Russia. While a source cited by the Miami Herald said food and medicine would likely be on the exemption list, international aid organizations argue the system would likely be ineffective and that sanctions largely stop out the trade of key civilian goods. So even if food and medicine are on the exemption list, just the the way that the, the game changes once a country is blacklisted in the way that they're looking to blacklist Russia, nobody is going to do any business with them because there's basically some way to run afoul of these sanctions, whether it's through insuring the shipment, uh, you know, whatever company does the shipment, all those things uh, make you so vulnerable to, to being, you know, legally attacked in the West uh, that, that nobody is going to do that. Now, Russia isn't Syria or Venezuela or North Korea. And so maybe there's less concern about a humanitarian catastrophe inside of Russia because it does have a lot of food production. Um, Now, that's not to say the Russian government can't make it so that his food production is so inefficient that people there do starve. Right. Like these are things that could happen. However, um, I, I think you know, maybe the medicine, like some select medicines may be an issue here. I do think Moscow has really saw the possibility on the horizon uh, uh, of facing this kind of economic war from the West and has worked to insulate its economy. So it probably does have ways to get, you know, food products that they need, uh, medicines that they need. Although, uh, you know, we will have to see going forward how the how this is actually implemented and, and how much this hurts the people of Russia. Uh, these kind of sanctions, uh, a full export ban has still uh, serious obstacles to overcome before the G7 summit in May. All EU members will have to agree for the bloc to sign on, and the ban could threaten the grain export deal that Turkey and the UN brokered with Russia last year. According to the European Union, since the agreement was implemented, 23 tons of food products have left Kiev's Black Sea ports. Since Russia invaded Ukraine 14 months ago, the White House has unleashed wave after wave of sanctions targeting Moscow, believing they would act as an economic equivalent of a nuclear weapon. While the Joe Biden administration hoped the rest of the world would join on the trade war after more than a year, only close Washington Western partners have followed Washington's lead. This has allowed Moscow to weather the sanctions and turn to other major trading partners in the Brits bloc and elsewhere, namely China and India. All right. So Ukraine is ramping up its culture war on, you know, the the Russian ethnicity and culture here. Ukrainian President Zelensky has approved two new laws intended to ease Ukraine's uh, erase Ukraine's Russia culture. And I I wrote this for the Libertarian Institute on April 23rd. The statues, uh, the statues will rename places in Ukraine, which stem from the country's Russian influence. Additionally, local authorities will be mandated to free public space from symbols of the the Russian world. The laws will prohibit names that perpetuate, promote, or symbolize the occupying states or its notable, memorable, historical, and cultural places, cities, dates, and events, and figures who carried out military aggression against Ukraine. The new statute was signed on Friday and will take effect in 30 days. Local officials will then have six months to completely scrub public places of the Russian culture. A board will be established to determine what names must be purged. Since 2014, Kiev has waged a culture war against Russian influence in Ukraine after a coup overthrew Viktor Yanukovych that year. New language 
which laws were implemented that sought to marginalize the Russian language. Zelensky, who at the time was a comedian, had one of his movies, Love in the Bay City 2, censored because it was in Russian. Roughly a fifth of the Ukrainians identify as ethnic Russians, and there are a lot of Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. After Moscow ordered its troops to invade Ukraine last year, Zelensky has furthered the process called de-Russification. Zelensky has nationalized the media, outlawed Zelensky's, outlawed his political opposition, targeted branches of the Orthodox Church it claims has ties to Moscow, and tore down monuments that represent the historical Russian influence in Ukraine. You can only imagine a situation where you know, these Republicans get their way. A war breaks out between the U.S. and Mexico over the drug cartels. Uh, you know, it would be pretty disturbing if in the U.S. we were, you know, going around and trying to erase any Spanish influence in the country. You know, Hispanic influence and, you know, anything that's in Spanish has to be only in English and things like that. But, you know, these are the type of steps that, that Ukraine is taking at this point. Uh, very strict language laws and uh, other cultural laws in that country. Uh, and the, the renaming of places, I'm sure, is going to be a huge mess. So uh, next up, Brazil's Lula reaffirms Ukraine's position after U.S. criticism. And we talked about this last week on the show. I, I wrote up how uh, Lula had, you know, said that what the West pouring weapons into Ukraine, they, they don't want to stop this war and that, you know, there needs to be some kind of way to end it. And he basically reaffirmed that, y yeah, this is... Um, what, what we need. He said during a recent trip to China that the U.S. should stop encouraging the war in Ukraine and start looking at peace. And, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more with that. So let's move on here. Uh, more potential negotiations. Francis Marcon said China seeks to help foster Russia-Ukraine negotiations. And this is interesting. These are two leaders who, you know, Brazil a little bit different, but you know, some ties to the West, you know, France, a, a firm NATO ally, a, a firm partner with with Washington have started to, you know, say we, we really need to find a way to wrap up this war. And they're willing to look at negotiations that could be successful that involve China. So uh, this is pretty interesting and important. All right. Uh, one last story here. U.S. approves F-16 equipment sale to Turkey after Finland NATO approval. You, you know, this is just a buy off. Right. Turkey uh, did a little bit of what the U.S. wanted. And so now they're going to get some weapons. Uh, that's the way the U.S. empire works. If they do more of what the U.S. wants and approve Sweden to join NATO, they'll probably get more weapons. Uh, again, you know, it, it's just that that's the way this all works. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Back with more shows next week.